All right, I think we're ready to go. I think it's time. Um, I'm excited to be here and hopefully share some information that I hope is useful. Um, if you're not deeply kind of involved in the container runtime world, Docker, Container D, Creo, hopefully some of this information will be helpful if you're making decisions about runtimes, um, if you're just interested in why the landscape exists, how do we get here. Um, that's kind of what we'll cover. My background, uh, in addition to my title at IBM, uh, I've been a longtime contributor in the Docker ecosystem, so I was a maintainer of the Docker engine uh, for a number of years. Uh, more recently, have worked on Containerd, which is a CNCF graduated project. Uh, it's a runtime that we'll talk about. It's it's used in IBM's managed Kubernetes and several other cloud providers. Um, so that's kind of my background. I've been involved in in uh, kind of the inner workings of of how container runtimes have grown from 2014, 2015 through today. Um, so yeah, I think we could all agree um, that of course the history of containers doesn't begin with Docker. I mean, you've probably heard of LXC or LXD. You've heard of the features in the Linux kernel that what we call a container is a set of features uh, that have, some of them have existed for more than a decade, you know, mount namespaces, PID namespaces. Uh, but I think we can all agree that the ease of use for a developer to type some of these commands, Docker really kind of exposed that interest in these technologies that had existed and people had been playing with for maybe 10 years or more. And so that brought us into you know, 2014, 2015, uh, everyone was talking about Docker. We're writing Docker files. People are, are packaging applications as containers. Um, but Docker wasn't the only container runtime. It was definitely a very popular one. Um, but Rocket from CoreOS was announced, um, I think, in December 2014. 2014, they came on the scene with some different ideas about how to run a container using those same features in Linux, uh, but yet with a different interface, a different way to identify the container. Um, and then, of course, in more recent years, we have Containerd, we have Creo, uh, but pre predating that, Cloud Foundry, which was a platform as a service, uh, still is a platform as a service open source project, uh, they were running containers and sort of using their own method to start containers. And I already mentioned, you know, LXC, LXD, again, had, had already created ways to, to instantiate a container and what is a container image. And then in the high performance computing space, uh, now there's Singularity and a few others. I didn't add their logos. But here's all these runtimes, lots of different ways to run containers. And the worry uh, in 2015 is, what if we end up in a world where once you commit to a tool, I can't switch to another runtime. You know, we all have different ideas about what it means to create a container image or what it means to start a container process. And so we really wanted this unifying definition of what it means to run a container. And so really that's how the OCI was born, the Open Container Initiative, similar to the CNCF, parented by the Linux Foundation. So officially we are, the OCI is a Linux foundation collaborative project. Um, and again, the idea was we'd like all these participants to get on the same page with respect to what it means to define uh, how to run a container, or how to build a container image. And so it started there in 2015 with starting to build a runtime specification, a actual reference implementation, which many of you have heard, if you've heard people talk about run C, that was a set of code that was in the Docker engine prior to 2015. It was actually uh, a subdirectory called libcontainer, which is now, if you go to the GitHub project for run C, you'll still see that libcontainer subdirectory, and many of those implementations have been the same now for many years. In addition to run C, so this sort of default way to run uh, the specified container, the OCI created an image format specification, and now more recently, we're also uh, hopefully finalizing a distribution spec. Uh, 
And so that's all work that, that's gone on all the way back to 2015. Um, and so uh, much of that work was finalized in 2017 with the release of the runtime spec 1.0 and the image spec uh, 1.0, so you can go back and see the announcements and read the blog posts. But this is really the, the, the culmination of what we wanted. We wanted a way for everyone to agree what's a container image, uh, how do we specify uh, what it means to run a container. And so that's really given us a common substrate on which we've built a lot of tools. Um, so these specifications, whether we're talking about Linux, uh, Microsoft has been fully involved in the OCI, so what it means to run a Windows container is also part of the OCI spec. And that gives us uh, a handful of runtimes today that, that I've listed here, some of them, not all of them, and a set of registries, you know, things like Docker Hub, uh, things like Project Harbor, uh, JFrog, various uh, public clouds have their own registry implementations, Quay. Um, all these are running on a common substrate so that I don't have to pick one tool and stick with it, and I can't switch until I sort of reformat or, or migrate my images or, or my container definitions to a different format. So that's a great place. That's, that's definitely what we wanted. And just to give you a kind of quick view into where the OCI is going, we're not necessarily done yet. Uh, this year we have... Uh, expanded with a new artifacts project. So defining other things that can be stored in, in registries. Uh, today you may have seen in other talks mention of CNAB, the uh, cloud native application bundle spec. Uh, there are those uh, in the community interested in, in uh, software uh, bundles like SPDX, like what's in my image. Uh, and so there are some common formats. And so a way to define the kinds of artifacts we want to store in registries, um, that's a new part of the OCI that's actually gotten a lot of interest from across the cloud providers and their registry teams. We're finalizing the distribution spec. So think of this as the way that runtimes today talk to like Docker Hub. That HTTP API is now going to be the OCI distribution spec. Uh, there's a meeting happening this week in Seattle talking about image signing. And again, this is an area where there have been some different ideas. You've heard of the CNCF projects uh, Notary or Tough. Uh, and then there's other, other sort of proposed ways to, image, to, to do image signing. Um, and so the OCI may find a way to standardize and, and bring uh, some disparate groups together around that. Uh, anyway, there's a lot of things that the OCI will continue to do hopefully to, again, bring us to a place uh, where, where we don't have to pick tools based on the format we like, that we have the interoperability to use Docker or Creo or Containerd or, or any number of tools built around the OCI specs. So that's the OCI. Let's turn our attention to Kubernetes. What runs your container in Kubernetes? You probably know this, but, but um, definitely there are those who who aren't aware of this, but Kubernetes is just the orchestrator. It has no built-in container engine um, in Kubernetes. It's always relied on a uh, runtime, and for almost, you know, back to the, the origins of Kubernetes, that's always been Docker. And this was kind of the, the architectural picture of what that looked like, the kubelet, which is installed on your worker node um, when the API, uh, server, the core part of Kubernetes, wants to schedule a pod on your node, it, it asks the kubelet to actually do that work. And so if you look in the Kubernetes code base, you can see this you know, Docker shim subdirectory, which has this uh, loose sort of API with the Docker engine. Hey, Docker, please go create this container. Here's the image reference. Here's kind of the way we want to run it. Um, and that was great when all we had was Docker. But then again, we had Rocket, and so there was a Rocket Netties, which had a way to drive, for the kubelet to drive Rocket. Uh, but obviously, it would be a bad situation to have a Kubernetes source tree that had separate code for how to drive all kinds of different container runtimes. And so that's when the Kubernetes CRI um, was decided upon and announced in late 2016. So you can go read this blog post. 
about the Kubernetes community and specifically Signode um, creating the container runtime interface, which is effectively an API that say you decided to write your own container runtime, this is the set of APIs that you would have to implement to be a container runtime for Kubernetes. Again, simple things like start a container, stop a container, pull an image from a registry. And so there's a set of, of specific tasks that a runtime must do on behalf of the kubelet that's um, created by the CRI API. And so this is a picture uh, I've shown several times and tried to update to make it clearer. Um, but there are obviously a set of runtimes today that, that implement the CRI. Um, they sort of loosely uh, default back to Docker, ContainerD, and Creo as the main ones, but there's a couple new additions in the last year. The Singularity team, so again, this is a high-performance computing um, runtime that uh, has a CRI implementation now that drives their own uh, container engine, which also now has an OCI-compliant uh, implementation as well. But if you think about the kubelet, again, wanting to talk to a socket that implements the CRI API, you can see that for ContainerD, there's a CRI plugin that handles that. For Creo, uh, the Creo engine handles that. Uh, Docker Shim will probably be sunset at some point. It's not truly uh, an implementation of the CRI, but in effect, it's sort of the de facto standard. So when people report a bug to ContainerD or Creo, it tends to be, hey, when I use Docker underneath Kubernetes, this is the way things work. And so the other CRI, CRI implementations tend to try and meet that ex expected behavior. Um, the reason I added a second entry for ContainerD is because we have a shim API in ContainerD that allows you to plug in other sandbox isolators like Kata containers, again, lightweight hypervisors. Uh, AWS created the Firecracker project about a year ago. Um, they also have a shim for ContainerD. Uh, Google's Gvisor team also has a shim so that you can run containers using their isolation in Gvisor. And so say you were building your own cluster, there's ways to tell the kubelet, hey, by the way, here's my container runtime, here's its socket where you can talk to the CRI API. And then as a user, um, there's some interesting new features in recent Kubernetes releases. One is runtime class to let you select among uh, various runtimes like Kata or Firecracker. For this pod, I'd actually like to use this runtime. And there's also some ways to do that uh, with annotations. So that's great. We have a sort of growing set of runtime choices uh, for containers. But where are things today? And again, uh, just to be clear, Docker is still the lion's share of usage of container runtimes today. This is a report uh, from Sysdig that just came out a few months ago. And as you would expect, uh, there's still a lot of usage of Docker as sort of a default runtime with ContainerD and Creo both growing. Uh, Creo is, has now become the default uh, in Red Hat's OpenShift. And so uh, as the, if you go and read the report from Sysdig, there's an expectation that those numbers will grow uh, this year and into the next one. Um, we also had a blog, blog post come out in May of last year. You can find it on the Kubernetes blog, um, just talking about our ContainerD integration with Kubernetes going GA and that both IBM's managed Kubernetes and GKE from Google allow you to use ContainerD as a runtime. I don't know if there's a blog post about it, but I did see that last week at reInvent, uh, AWS announced that Fargate uh, also has switched to ContainerD as a runtime. And so we're seeing kind of some growing use of ContainerD in those spaces. So the next question you might ask yourself is why? Why do we have these different container runtimes? Um, in, some, in some sense, it may be an existential question because people like to create software and people like to sort of make their own decisions. Um, but there are some interesting characteristics and differences between some of these runtimes that may be of interest if you're the one creating clusters. Obviously, if you're leaving that up to a cloud provider, then it's really at their discretion uh, 
you know, for oper operability and, and, and their SRE team, what do they want to use? And you're sort of at the mercy of their choices. But maybe you have some concerns around performance or stability. Um, ContainerD and Creo are both smaller than, than Docker in both uh, functionality and feature set. And so there, are, there have been some, some talks and some presentations about improved performance with smaller runtimes. If you're interested in extensibility or sort of custom use cases, uh, we've had a lot of use of ContainerD because we have an extensible API and some plug pluggability. Um, actually, on the right here, if you want, I've already uploaded these charts to uh, SCED. Um, but I tried to walk through that at KubeCon in San Diego a few days ago. You know, what are the reasons uh, and pros and cons of various, um, various runtime choices? And so I talked through some of the custom uses we're seeing, like the Azure team uh, just recently wrote a snapshot driver for ContainerD to give them a new feature in their registry to quickly share layers across clusters if they're all within the Azure uh, container service. If you're interested in compatibility with a very specific Kubernetes release, then one of the things Creo has done is their version number actually matches the Kubernetes version number. So if I've got a Kubernetes cluster with version 1.15, there's a Creo release called v1.15. And so obviously that may be of interest that they've done very specific testing and integration with a specific version of Kubernetes. And I already mentioned the sort of custom isolators, Kata containers, Gvisor, Nabla, uh, Firecracker. Maybe your choice is going to be based on how can I get access to these additional sort of isolation features, these additional uh, sandboxes. So uh, if you do want more information on that, we don't have time during this talk to kind of walk through Kata containers or Gvisor or Firecracker. Uh, but this tweet came from, from KubeCon. Uh, just a few weeks ago in San Diego, um, that you know, a lot of people there's a there's sort of growing interest in these lightweight virtualization and sort of new sandbox ideas, and I found that as well. I saw a lot of people talking about it late last year, and so I also have an InfoQ article if you're interested that tries to dig into why are people interested and what are the additional sort of security benefits of these you know hypervisor or alternate sandboxes. And so that's also uh, has a lot more detail. But again, Kata, Gvisor, Nabla, Firecracker, these are all interesting projects where hypervisors can sort of marry with the simplicity of containers to give you some added isolation uh, and security primitives that you can't get with sort of pure Linux containers. So the other thing you might ask is, well, this sounds confusing. What if I have different clusters with different runtimes? You know, everybody has their own sort of client tool, whether it's the Docker client or CTR for Containerd. Uh, Red Hat has created a series of tools around Creo, so maybe you've heard of Podman or Scopio or Builda. So the nice thing is, at least when we're talking about Kubernetes and the CRI API, there's a, a command that's actually part of the uh, Kubernetes code base um, called cryctl, that this actually talks to your runtime directly via, via that CRI API. And so you can do things that look very similar to, you know, like the Docker user experience. I can list the pods, I can list containers that are running, I can stop or remove, pull new images, look at the images I have uh, locally. So. Again, there's a user's guide uh, that can be helpful if you're just trying to understand how do I, in this new world of Kubernetes runtimes via the CRI, how can I administer or debug or look into that? And so there's, there's a, a nice common interface uh, for you to do that. So um, in summary, I think there's a lot of positives that have come out of the OCI. Uh, for example, we now have uh, in essence, this level playing field for higher level abstractions. Uh, we don't have to fight about, you know, whose container tool built which image. Um, and so that, that gives us really nice interoperability. So you see, you know, a growing number of, of 
tools, for example, in the CI, CD, and build space. We don't all have to use Docker build. You can use Tekton, you know, Knative build. There's all kinds of tools out there. And thankfully, because we're all conforming to the OCI specs, um, all those tools can work together. And really, uh, with all the right players coming together in OCI, we've had great cross-industry collaboration in this space. You know, we're not all doing different things, going off in different directions. Um, and so that really allows end user choice or operator choice in what, what tools to use. An interesting side effect of that is that uh, what I'm calling the network effects. So if you think about uh, LXC or LXD or these high performance computing runtimes like Singularity, on their own they didn't necessarily have any reason to be OCI compliant. You know, they're not really in the sort of Docker use case world. Uh, but within the last year, both those runtimes have added OCI compatibility. And so I think that's a nice sort of add-on effect of the OCI is that we're, we're getting OCI compatibility even more broadly than just the Docker-like uh, runtimes. So you add to that the CRI, and we really do, we're in this place now where there's runtime choice for your Kubernetes cluster. Um, you can build your own cluster, you can pick your own runtime, and that's really a set of the positives of both OCI and CRI. Um, the not so great part of that is that now that you have choice, people wanna know why, how do I choose? And so um, trying to help users understand why they have choices and, and how to make those choices on their own uh, is really the, I think the onus is on uh, the CNCF, the OCI, and those of us in that space to try and help people understand, for example, that talk I referenced from San Diego, just trying to show pros and cons of all the different choices. And really, um, especially when we're talking about sandbox containers, I don't know how many of you were just in Ian's talk uh, next door, um, but that's a whole area where trying to figure out what's my threat model, what am I trying to protect against, and which of these tools can provide sort of the best uh, way for me to reach those, those goals on protection and defense in depth. Um, I think we still have work to do to, to help people understand how to choose developer tools in this world. Again, it can be confusing when you see uh, people talking about Podman or Docker or people playing with Containerd and the CTR tool. Um, you know, where do we point people to go who are looking for that Docker run replacement? You know, what, what are we gonna sort of give the community there? And I, I don't think there's one necessarily easy answer, but that's something I think as we're in a maturing time of our eco ecosystem is helping figure out what's that common tooling. And then for the OCI ourselves, um, we're trying to keep the momentum. You know, it was great to, to have those 1.0 specs uh, available um, back in 2017, but really uh, completing some of the, some other standardization, like I talked about around distribution, around image signing, and other areas that are interesting uh, in our ecosystem. So that's a little bit of a whirlwind tour through OCI and the CRI interfaces. Um, there's a lot more that we could talk about. There's other talks I can point you to. I'd be happy to to answer questions, but I think we've got the keynotes in a little bit, and I think uh, this is effectively uh, the time I had, so thanks very much for your attention, and uh, good luck with uh, choosing a container runtime.